This week, a neighbour has told an inquest into the disappearance of William Tyrrell that he's 100% sure he saw a boy in a, in a Spider-Man suit the day the three-year-old disappeared. I spoke to Caroline Overington, the Associate Editor of The Australian and host of the incredible podcast Nowhere Child that's exploring the investigation into Tyrrell's disappearance on this new evidence that was made public just this week. Well, he's 100% sure that it was William. And one of the most incredible things about being at the inquest was to, to see William's family absolutely thunderstruck by this development. Here is so a man... So they didn't even know about it? Well, he was 75 years old at the time. He's a very well-respected man in the local area. He's a judge of flower shows. He attends things like um, local community events all the time. He's lived there since the 1980s, so coming on for 40 years. Um, he was very alert that morning. Particularly that morning he was very alert because one of the things he does is propagate flowers and cuttings. And he was waiting for a delivery of some small cuttings from Plants Express. And you can't leave them in the post office overnight. And this was a Friday. William went missing on a Friday. And so he was particularly alert for the sound of the mailbox because he thought, well, as soon as my package arrives, I'll go and get it. He heard what he thought was a little click, a rusty click of the metal uh, letterbox. He came down the stairs. He's not... Um, terrifically mobile. He came down using his hand on the handrail. He was about one step down the veranda when he saw a car come careering around the corner. And the reason he noticed it was because, well, two reasons. It was travelling at speed and it was also coming almost off the tarmac. So it was a kind of car that you could, you could kind of see was swinging around the corner into his driveway and, and no further than from, from his veranda to the street. So he has a really good line of vision. And he's 100% sure that he saw a child standing in the back seat, hands up against the glass and his face peering out between his hands, wearing a Spider-Man suit. His concern at the time was that he was unrestrained. He said the little boy was not crying, but he was unrestrained in the back and she was moving at speed. And then about 50 yards behind, he says yards because he's a 75-year-old man, he's now 80, um, another car. And he ha had the impression that they may have been travelling together, that one was following the other one. And this one, the second one, when it came around the corner, actually came around on the opposite side of the road. So had somebody been coming, there would have been a head-on. So this Did he is, say who was driving that second car? The second car he doesn't know, didn't get a clear view of the driver, but the first car, definitely a woman. He said it was definitely a woman, plumpish, blonde hair piled into a bun on top of her head and a white blouse with short sleeves. It was the kind of event he noticed. This he is no explosive evidence. It, quite incredible. Given, but also, given we thought no one had seen William right. Tyrrell at all on the day he disappeared. Right. And the thing that's most... Well, that's incredible enough, the fact that there is indeed a witness, um, but also he didn't immediately go to police. And people have, of course, said, why? Why would you not go to police? And it's a really relevant question. And I think the public doesn't always behave the way we expect them to behave. So he didn't know at the time of this happening that a child was missing. Nobody did. About 15 minutes later, he heard sirens and he assumed somebody in the area had maybe died. It was an ambulance. You know, a lot of elderly people live around there. Didn't think too much of it. Later that night on the news, he, heard, he hears a report that a child is missing, but he doesn't see a picture, so he's not thinking anything. The next day, he sees the first picture of William and he knows instantly, he, that was the boy that I saw in the car. And he thinks to himself, police, of course, but the detective who's making this announcement on the local news, so on the, which, and it's the local news out there, it's not like a big network, they all watch the local news, says, we will be interviewing all the neighbours in a one kilometre radius. And because he's a good citizen, he waits his turn. So he sits and he waits for the knock on the door. And it never comes. It never comes. But and then, then surely uh, after well, a number of months or, or even well, years, Well, after a number of weeks. A yeah. no, some weeks go by. So he's waiting and he's thinking, well, police obviously know what they're doing. They're talking to, you know, the foster parents who were... who William was in the care of foster parents when he went missing. Probably they're talking to other people, neighbours. You know, they know what they're doing. So I'll wait, like a good citizen does. Then after a few weeks, he thinks, well, I really should tell someone. So he goes and tries to track down the local cop. I mean, this is a country town. He's known the local police officer, Wendy Hudson, since she was a baby. So he tries to track her down at the local club on a Friday night where he often sees her. As it happens, she's not there that night. But he sees her sister-in-law because, again, country town. And so he tells the sister-in-law, hey, you should tell Wendy that I saw a little boy in the backseat of the car that day. The message doesn't get passed on. 
So then eventually the fact that he's telling people that this is what he saw, including all five of his sisters and, I understand, 12 people in total, gets back to police because it's a small town. And so police come and knock on his door in 2015. How, so this is how long after Mil to, Mil first time. So William goes missing in September of 2014. Police knock on his door in 2015 and again in 2016 and he tells them the story. But no statement is taken from him, no walkthrough, no description of the cars and the drivers until April of 2017. I mean, a so major... that's a thousand days. And how much detail in your memory is lost in a thousand days? Period. Now, I want to ask you about one of the other uh, persons of interest in this case, or someone who has been a person of interest in this case, the local washing repairman Bill Spedding. Now, the inquest has heard that he had a very strong alibi on the day that William went missing. This has been devastating for him and his family. So you're quite right, he's the local repairman. He repairs white goods, refrigerators, washing machines, any kind of white good. And he went to the Tyrrell house on the 9th of September, two days before William went missing, to try to fix the washing machine. He couldn't because he didn't have the parts. So he said he'd come back with the parts as soon as they arrived. Then on the day that William was there, William's foster mum called his answering machine and said, hey, you know, the washing's piling up here, where are the parts, kind of thing. Police heard about that call and wondered. Had he got the message and thought, oh, I better go and fix that, or I better go and drop those, those parts off, and had he swung into the street and had something happen, I mean, maybe even an accident. It's a reasonable line of inquiry. You would definitely want to rule him out. But you could have ruled him out so fast. A couple of reasons you could rule him out. He didn't have the parts. We know that because we've got a receipt for the day they were delivered and they were delivered after William went missing. We also know that he was at a school assembly that day watching his grandkids get an award and we know that because other parents have said so. We know that he had a cup of coffee just before he went to the school assembly and we know that, Shari, because he's got a receipt. And that was around the time William went missing. Exactly. He, co he yeah. couldn't possibly have made it from where he was to Benaroon Drive, where William went missing from. That evidence has been available to police for a long time. And so what Mr Spedding is saying is, why have I been hung out there as the one whose name is linked to this? Everyone you talk to said, oh, you know, could it be the washing machine guy they're all talking about? He says his life has been destroyed. And he could, once you become a person of interest, how do you ever unbecome one. How very, do you get very, off that list? Very, very difficult. Uh, now, in terms of um, the foster parents, police very quickly ruled them out uh, as being, you know, people of, of interest and usually, as you pointed out in your podcast, usually um, when someone goes missing or is abducted or, you know, any sort of crime, it's the people closest to them that, that police examine first. Why were they so quickly ruled out? You're exactly right. In, in, in most murders, most people kill someone they know. That, that's absolutely the case in Australia and, in fact, it's the case in most democracies. So when police go looking for somebody who's... for the culprit when somebody's being killed, it's almost always someone that they know. There's some kind of connection. It's either a husband or a wife, usually a husband, not a wife, but a wife or somebody else, business connection, that kind of thing. When it's a child, it's even more... Uh, the, the statistics are even more incredible. 97% of the time... It's somebody known to the child, 97% of the time. So the first thing the police have to do is rule out those with... Who were the last people to see William alive? And in this particular case, it was his foster mum and her mum and William's sister, who was four years old at the time. And they got ruled out really quickly. The next person to see him alive was his dad, who had, who had already exited the scene by the time William went missing. He was then ruled out. And then they started looking at a wider circle. So they started looking at William's biological parents, also very quickly ruled out. One of the things that the inquest is looking at is what kind of investigative techniques did police use when they're ruling people out? People are fascinated by that. And how have the foster parents handled this uh, so far, I mean, they, they still have... They're still looking after or having their care. Um, William's sister... They do. Um, how have they handled the intense media interest in the police investigation in this case? Well, do you know what, Shari? It's actually very difficult to know because um, William's foster mum has attended the inquest every day. Um, William's foster dad has not been there this, these past two weeks. William's biological parents have been there every day. His biological father has been there every day and so has his biological nana. Um, Who you've the, interviewed, of course. Mm -hmm, yes, and the biological parents tend to sit in the public gallery 
and um, mix with other people who are attending. But William's foster mum doesn't. And the reason that she doesn't is she's kind of kept in a separate room. And part of that is because of all the secrecy and suppression surrounding her identity. It's against the law in New South Wales to identify, uh, interview, name a foster parent. And so she's kept very separate from the proceedings in that sense. Um, she has done a number of interviews over the years, including with um, Michael Usher on 60 Minutes, when he was still on 60 Minutes about, um, I'm going to say, three years ago. So she has done a, a couple of interviews. But each time you have to obscure their faces and you're not allowed to tell people their names. And I think it's become quite difficult for the public to connect with them. If you, can, if you compare that, to example, with the Morecambs, Denise and Bruce Morkham. The Australian they were the public, face of the campaign. yeah, they, they travelled. Mm, the, we the, came to the know country. them and really to love them and to feel their agony and to feel their anguish, and, and the public was really connected to that case. I think the secrecy provisions in this case, which are largely, indeed, solely the responsibility of the New South Wales government, have meant that the public have found it really hard to get behind this case. They find it um, mysterious, they find it fascinating, but they can't really connect with the people in well, it. It's incredible that it took a, a member of the public taking uh, this case to the Supreme Court before we could even find out that William Tyrrell was in foster care. You know, I find uh, that... Do, do, do you think this secrecy is a case of uh, community services trying to protect itself, try to cover up for any scandals or embarrassment that, that you know, they might endure as a result of this? I cannot for the life of me understand why a government department would insist on secrecy in a case like this. Essentially they have banned, prohibited, prevented anyone in William's family from advocating for him. And I just think that's scandalous. I just think the idea that you cannot stand up and plead for your child and even now, five years later, stand up and ask questions about why he hasn't been found. I find that, I, I think, I mean, I think it's disgraceful. I really do. And the law must change. There is no stigma at all to be associated with being a foster child. Why should there be? I mean, they are the most precious children of all. And we as a community have agreed to take care of them to take them in and look after them. Some of them end up being adopted into family homes. They become uh, loved members of our communities. And the idea that one of them can go missing and everybody has to stand mute, I think is disgraceful. Caroline, thank you so much for your time oh, Thank today. you for your time. Such and, an important case. And uh, your podcast, Nowhere Child, you've just released episode seven today? Episode seven, yes. Look forward to listening to the rest of it. Thank you okay, so much. Okay, take care.